All right, so let's talk about the Hexaco, which is the cutting edge of research regarding personality assessment. Some of you might know the big five personality test, and the Hexaco is just really the more cutting edge and is basically, it's not an all or nothing principle, but basically taking the big five, but adding a sixth factor, which is about honesty, humility. The Hexaco is also cross-culturally valid, so can, you can use this test anywhere in the world. And the interesting thing is that the Hexaco is adding something that the previous tests didn't have, and that is a self and other rating. So you can't just do the test on your own. You also need somebody else who's doing the test on behalf of you, so rating you, because personality depends on the situation. That's what research realized, and they realized that they need to embody that also within personality assessments. So let's talk about each dimension real quick. It's honesty, humility, extraversion, conscientiousness, emotionality, agreeableness, and openness. And below each dimension, you see four key terms. And those four key terms, that's what this one dimension consists of. And that's giving you a very broad overview. If you want to read about this a little bit closer and actually advise you that, you can read that on hexaco.org slash scale descriptions. They give you a very quick but still deeper and you can see it here on the slide, overview about each dimension. And they do this very good. I'm, I couldn't do it better. And that's why I just want to don't want to waste your time. You can read that up there. Some people might now ask themselves, is a personality assessment actually such a great idea? Because people can just fake it. They know what's socially desirable. Why? Right. But research has shown that there's actually only minimal impact because of fake. And if people fake, that might be even good because they know what's socially desirable. And they might know the signs and have the social awareness and know when it's required to behave a little bit different. So, so far at this point, research says there's not too much impact on faking. And in fact, there are some statements and some tricks where you can kind of test the validity and the truthness of this specific personality. So what we're going to do right now is I'm actually going to show you a real life example. I'm showing you my personality assessment and I did that two years ago and I not only did it on my own I actually sent it multiple friends and family members and we will discuss it a little bit we also talk about each dimension a little bit into depth not what it is but what it means and what kind of long-term predictions you can make based on that so let's start at honesty humility and people might think and when you're very honest and humble that's probably the best thing you can do right so if you're very high in honesty, humility, that's a very good thing. Also, based on the reasoning that research has shown, being low on honesty, humility is associated with being materialistic, power-seeking, higher probability for workplace delinquency, common criminality, or having an unethical business. But on the other hand, you got to keep the balance. Because when you are, or if you're, very honest and very humble you can even be too honest you can be too fair and people will use you and that's what you also don't want to have so personally i think and that's not based on research right now i think 3.7 3.8 maybe even 4 that's a pretty decent score but being very aware and a lot of people who are scoring high on honesty humility don't have that be aware of the power of situation that depends and you got to adjust your behavior based on the situation. That's what you got to do. Interesting thing here is that one of my friends, you can see it's Jana, she scored very high on that. She says, Marco, you're super honest, you're super humble. You can also see that already on agreeableness and openness. Marco, you're super agreeable, super open and honest. And that's kind of Maybe it's an outlier, I don't know. I recently talked with her about that into depth. Why did she rate me that high? And it also kind of makes sense, but you already nevertheless still have to take this with caution and just think about this. What kind of conversations do I have with this friend? From which angle does she know me? And why did she rate me that high? Let's go to the second dimension, emotionality. Emotionality, that means when you're very high on it, you actually have a lower self-esteem and a higher probability for depression. Of course, we can't generalize that, but there's a tendency. On the other hand, being very low, but like really low, maybe 1.5 or something like that, that might be the case that you might be a narcissist or a psychopath. In general, males, of course, going scoring a little bit lower than 
than females. It's just a fact how society grew and all kind of factors that play a role right here. You can see this is for me the lowest dimension within all the others, but nevertheless it's still it's almost three the average. By the way, the black dots, those are the averages already, always. Um, yeah, it's neutral, it's okay. I think you can score a little bit higher. I would like to score a little bit higher, but that's something I identify right here. I also see how people perceive me. And I can then work on this and decide, hey, is this good or bad? But again, it also depends on the situation very much. Extraversion, next one. People who are very extroverted, they gain energy when they are with a lot of people. Extraversion is also associated with high reward sensitivity. And it's more likely to find a given goal rewarding. Interesting here is that I myself actually rated me the lowest. Why is that now? If you think about it, it makes actually sense because all the people I gave the hexacode are deep friends, close friends, or family members. They know me a lot. And when I'm with those, I'm of course more extroverted because I know them very much. But I know myself also in different situations when I'm with strangers. And I know, especially when it comes down to socializing in a new group, I don't know anybody. I'm rather introverted. And that's why I think there's also a certain truth towards it that I rated myself that low. And this might reflect my personality, my deep personality, actually a little bit more truthfully because I know myself from more perspectives. Let's talk about agreeableness. And there's a negative correlation regarding career success. So if you're low on agreeableness, it will serve your career. And if I would be really above four, as Jana rated me again, I think it would not serve me my career as well, uh, as well. It would be kind of too high because if you're too high in agreeableness, you're too flexible, you're trying to serve everybody else, but not yourself. So you gotta have the right balance here. As you can also see, my mom rated me the lowest. Why is that? Of course, she knows me more back in the days when I lived at home, I was younger, I was in puberty, I didn't like washing dishes. Also, this is the only individual within this test that is from another generation. So of course we have different views about life and that's obvious that she's then rating me a little bit lower in agreeableness. All those factors maybe play a role together. And you can observe the same consensuousness. I think it's the same when it comes down to washing dishes or whatever from back then. But who's rating me the highest on consensuousness? That's Joris. And that's basically one of my best friends from Maastricht where I study psychology. And he ma mainly knows me from this circumstances, university psychology. And he knows I'm high on consensuousness. I'm doing my thing. And if he has a question, I probably know at least something. Consensuousness also means that you're prioritizing long-term goals over immediate gratification. You're also trying to avoid uncertainty. So being super high on consensuousness is not the best. Having five or something on there, that's not necessarily the best thing. Usually that also correlates then with being socially awkward or something like that. And yeah, nevertheless, it's the single best predictor for career success. Only it's though 0.2, but it's the best predictor when it comes down to those six dimensions right here. Proactivity is actually even better, but that can be connected to consensuousness at 0.25. Because being proactive means to take the initiative and build momentum to positively change their current circumstances rather than just being passive and accepting the current circumstances, the situation. And that's related to consensuousness. Let's talk about the last point, openness to experience, being creative, curious, seeking novel information. Maslow, Abraham Maslow, he actually stated that openness is an indicator for self-actualization. I agree and I actually think it's desirable to be high on there, be having 4.5, something like that. That's pretty desirable and I think most people should work on that and gain this skill, of course. Nevertheless, in general, you have to differ and the sets of personality variables, because it depends on the situation how useful it is for different, for example, occupational groups. If you want to be a salesman, check extroversion, agreeableness, and consensuousness. Really important. The other two are not as predictive. If you want to be a policeman, agreeableness and consensuousness are key traits you got to have. 
If you want to predict whether somebody is motivated regarding their work on the long run, if you hire them, they got to be low on neuro neuroticism but high on conscientiousness. Counterproductive behavior. Conscientiousness, agreeableness, and emotional stability are negatively related to that. The others are not as predictive. You can't tell so much based on the other dimensions. And to which degree you're good regarding conflicts and negotiation, that's determined by extroversion and agreeableness. At least it's predictive to a certain degree. It's not the only factors here, of course. Let's more make some more long-term predictions. You want to have a healthy relationship? How likely is it? Being high on agreeableness and low on neuroticism, which is the opposite of emotionality. Those are the most important factors regarding the hexaco when it comes down to a relationship. When you're anxious, but also sociable, this combination leads to the fact that you're very likely in a relationship. Not that it's necessarily a good one, but you're probably in a relationship. If you want to be a good friend or have a lot of deep friends, honesty, humility, and openness, those two traits are key. If you want to be healthy and live a long life, also comes down to substance abuse, so also self-control is important here, which means that conscientiousness and emotional stability, those two are important for being healthy and having a long life. In general, what research also showed is, for example, through an in, throughout an interview, you don't need to give them necessarily a test, you can also ask them straight, and they will mostly tell you. That's what research says. Ask them, hey, are you high in conscientiousness? Are you doing your work? And they will tell you, yes, I am. But sometimes, you know, it depends on the situation. They will mostly tell you. Why did I tell you about the Hexaco? I think it's just another puzzle piece that is giving you some insights about your personality. And it's an indicator, maybe even a, a catalyst to identify your identity. It's not showing you the whole identity. It's just another puzzle piece that you can put in perspective, contemplate. Maybe you gain some insights. You do some more research about a specific topic because it seems like you're doing this well. You gain some more information. That's, again, the process. So do the test. Send it also to a friend so you can do it for you and you can do it for him. And you can check and discuss, contemplate the own results and raise self-awareness. If you're interested about this topic a little bit more, the next video will be about the development over your lifespan regarding specifically those six dimensions. How do they develop over the whole entire lifespan? Because, of course, personality is not a fixed thing. It evolves only to a certain degree the older you get. But nevertheless, it will evolve. And that's what we're discussing in the next video. So if you're interested about that, check it out. Give a thumb up if you like the video and if you want more of those kind of videos and also subscribe to this YouTube channel if you want to have in general more information about personality, self-knowledge, but also about in general developing and growing from a psychological perspective. Here's what you say. You